Hey, my Alex Rackle from Board Game Co, and this is, well, it's going to be a bit of an experiment to see how well this goes. Welcome to my new set. Well, new set in progress. You can see some Callus Cubbies are up, some Callus Cubbies are wrong hands. Some Callus Cubbies are up, some Callus Cubbies are not. Uh, it might be a little echoey in here still because, well, half the room is still empty. I'm moving things over, so bear with me on, um, well, any and all issues. Also, the way the camera's set up here, I'm used to the camera being over here and the screen being over here, the camera's now over here and the screen's over here, which is going to confuse me to no end. But let's go ahead and dive into this and see how this goes. This is two back or not to back. Uh, I lost my train of thought. This is two back or not to back. We're going to dive into a variety of crowdfunding campaigns, talking about the campaigns, talking about the games themselves, the pledge levels, the add ons, the stretch goals, all those various things. I also forgot I'm dealing with a slight cough right now, so if I, if I do have to cough, I apologize, or if there are random cuts, it's because of because of the cough. But with that, we're going to go ahead and dive into this. As usual, reminder, the uh, disclaimer and all that stuff that I do work for GameFound, please take that into account as we go through these videos. And as usual, we go through these games. And as usual, we're going to go ahead and start off with our Cult of the Now. Cult of the Now is a segment where we take a look at a currently available crowdfund, a currently available retail game. In this case, the game is going to be Cusco Classic Edition from Queen Games. Uh, in general, we're going to go through a lot of crowdfunding campaigns, a lot of games that are very, very cool, very, very fun, including some great games on today's round. we got some really great games coming up ahead of you, but, as a reminder, you can go ahead and get great games now. You don't have to wait a year and a half. You don't have to wonder if you'll still be interested in the game in a year and a half. You don't have to wonder if your game group will still be there. You don't have to wonder if the game will be any good or check out other reviews or all that stuff. Uh, games in retail, you can go ahead and back now. Now, granted, not back now, buy now. Granted, Cusco is not the cheapest game, coming in at $75, but it is a great game. It's a re-implementation of Bora Bora, the original Stefan Fell title, and I think they did a great job both in terms of improving the gameplay as well as improving the look of the game, and I already thought Bora Bora looked pretty darn good. I also thought Bora Bora was pretty darn good. So the fact that they approved of the look and the, the feel of the game, honestly not bad. It's Cusco might be my favorite game in the Queen Game City Collection so far. In any case, uh, that's going to be available over our miniature market, and that is not sponsored. These never are. But with that, we're going to go ahead and dive into Board Game Adjacent. Board Game Adjacent is going to be where we, uh, you know, but I think it's, I think we call it Board Game Adjacent. Board Game Adjacent, that's what we call it. Right? Tabletop Adjacent? I don't know. Either way, we have Maximum Apocalypse, and if you're like, Maximum Apocalypse is a board game, you're right. It is a board game from Rock Manor Games, but this is Mac Maximum Apocalypse, the video game from Rock Manor Games. They're coming out with a video game version of this, of this game, basically. Uh, a deluxe video game adaptation, and you can go ahead and get the video game itself. You can get early access to the beta for $12, but you can also go ahead and get, you know, other things, the OST, you can get the digital deluxe, the digital all-in, all these various things in case you want this game, but they also have ways to get Maximum Apocalypse, the board game, as well as a variety of expansions. So if you are interested in Maximum Apocalypse, clips either in video game form or in the board game, you can go ahead and check out this campaign for a variety of options. I won't have to be diving into it, it's more video game, but at the very least you should know it exists. We also have Tiny Tables over here, and Tiny Tables is definitely in the uh, adjacent category. This is not even like a board game table, this is kind of a component holder slash uh, fun piece or whatnot. This is the Tiny Tables from Mesa Perellagos, I believe it's pronounced something along those lines. But either way, Tiny Tables is going to have an actual table, but you can go ahead and turn it into component holders or a dice tray or any number of different things depending on how you orient it or display it or tilt it on its side, all those fun things. But yeah. If you're interested in any of these things, they are running you, I believe, around $40, no, €65 Euro per, for a basic table, and then they go up, you know, or they go down as you get more and more together, so you get discounts if you get more of them, plus save on shipping as well, but they're definitely not the cheapest as far as uh, component holders go, but if you do like that idea of a um, fun little piece or whatnot, fun little uh, discussion piece, uh, then this definitely works for that. But then we're going to go ahead and dive into the uh, not yet funded category, which is going to have Warline X Dragon's War. Warline is a game that came out a while ago over on Kickstarter. They had the first version of the game. I don't remember what it's called, but they had the first version of the game. This is a tactical strategic game, and if you are interested in more information on this game, I highly recommend checking out Tim Chun's series of videos. Tim Chun has done video videos on this game, both sponsored and not sponsored content, which, and again, I know there's always going to be that uncertainty around, you know, can I trust a, you know, a review when there is sponsored content there. And I think you do have to evaluate both the content creators as you know, as well as the fact that in, some, in the case of like Tim Chun, most of the time he won't do the review. So when he chooses to do the review as well as doing sponsored content, it almost certainly means that he is like just passionate about the game and wanted to express that passion. So I take it at face value. I'll also say that Tim Chun loves Aquatica, and I love Aquatica, which means he has good taste. But past that, Warline X Dragon's War is a standalone edition of the game. Now there is expansion content for this game, sort of, or there's ways to get the expanded content, there's ways to get the base game over here, there's ways to get the, uh, the standalone edition over here, and there's expansion content as well. Well, all of that in this tactical uh, sort of dice, but not really dice area control skirmish game over here. Uh, that's basically what we got for Warline. Again, it's not yet funded over here. It should fund, I imagine, uh, we're looking at $10,000 on a $12,000 goal, which means it should fund. Six days left to go. We should be in the clear. As far as should you back or should you not, we'll hold this value. Looking at the original one, it doesn't 
look like it did, but there's also not a lot of sales data. With only 102 backers, if you want this game, this is your best chance to guarantee access to it, but it's likely one that won't hold this value if you find it's not a game that works for you. Moving on over here, we have Dabawala. Dabawala, $14,000 raised, 252 backers, three days to go. I'm coming to you from Queen Games. Dabawala is going to be a polyomino game, a polyomino tile laying game. Well, I guess polyominoes are by default tile laying games, but in which you chase basically stacking polyominoes higher and higher in increasing rows as you uh, organize your food cart to make deliveries. Now, you're going to be going through two phases in the game. The first phase is going to have you laying down polyominoes, trying to be mindful of the colors you lay down in each layer, but more importantly, being mindful of the other players and the colors they lay down in each layer. And the second phase of the game, you're going to be holding onto these cards that you use to place polyominoes, and you're going to be using them instead to score your polyomino layers, but everyone is contributing to the score of a layer at the same time, which is why you want to pay attention to what other people are doing, because you can feed into their choices and boost yourself if you pay proper attention to the other others at the table. So it's going to be basically laying down polyominoes and then scoring for each section of polyomino based on the colors that are scoring in the round. There's a few modules as well. You can check out my full review if you want more information on it or a variety of other content. I think there's gameplay content out there. I'm not sure. Either way, we have Dabawala for $35 for uh, MSRP of $49.99. In general, if you've watched the show before, you know that MSRP savings are always iffy because generally a game on online retail is going to be priced somewhere between 20 to 30 percent off MSRP anyways. So that 30 percent off MSRP right now is the $35 you're seeing right now. So right now, it's basically giving you a slightly better than average price, maybe because 20 to 30%, they're giving you 30%, but you also have to factor in the fact that they're shipping, which means you're going to be paying more for Dabawala right now than you would be paying if you got it down the road on its own. So the individual game on its own, probably not worth getting unless you're just trying to get it early or support the creator, or if you're looking at it from a place where you can't get that kind of a pricing discounts. Alternatively, moving up on the chair over here, if you do want other games, that savings gets better. Because you're still seeing that 30% savings, although you're getting even higher if you choose to add in Marrakesh, but even Dabawala and Graffiti, $70 on $100 MSRP, that is a better savings because once you factor in the shipping over there, the shipping is going to still be chunk taking a chunk out of it, but not as big of a chunk. So it's kind of worth it if you're sure you want both those games. Really the plus level that is most worth it if you're interested in these games is going to be the Early Bird Big Bundle over here for $100. $110. There's currently 78 left out of 100. Then it's Queen Games. They've done these early birds before, so it may or may not be a real early bird because they have this one down here. But they're not going to hit the 7. They're not going to come close to the 100 anyway, I imagine. But if you are looking for this over here, the $110 on $180 MSRP, if you are interested in all those three games, that is a good price point for them. The tricky part is America does a decent job holding its value versus uh, Graffiti and Dabawala, I imagine less so. So if you're looking just the best price point for you, the early bird does probably make sense. But if you're looking for holding its value overall, I still think that bundle is not necessarily going to hold its value overall once you factor in shipping and all that. Moving on over here, we have Return to the Seventh Citadel, Explore, Build, You Are the Hero. Nine days to go on this campaign, 8,328 backers, $943,000 raised. It is doing tremendously well, although not nearly as well as the original Seventh Citadel did, and I think this is the amount of fatigue in the, uh, well, in crowdfunding space in general, but also on just campaigns that took this long to deliver. This is not something that's new to the space. We've seen this with Assassin's Creed, where the game took two and a half years to deliver, and then the follow-up campaign just did much less. Uh, we've seen it with Seventh Citadel over here. We've seen it before in general, there's a certain amount of burnout that happens in the crowdfunding space. When people wait this long to get their hands to 7th Citadel, by the time, like if you look at 7th Continent versus the second Kickstarter for 7th Continent, it did so much higher. Because there's such low access, people got the game, it was amazing, it was incredible, and then the second Kickstarter came out and people wanted that. On the other hand, the second Kickstarter for 7th Citadel, just the sheer amount of time and also the fact that 7th Continent has flooded the market just means the demand for the second Kickstarter over here has been lesser. Again, it's going to cost a million dollars, it's still doing well, make no mistake. But it's not doing the original levels levels well. And again, I think that certain amount of fatigue is present in the tabletop space to a degree, although, well, we'll see, either way. But as far as the game itself, Seven Citadel is going to be building off the seventh continent gameplay, in which you're going to be laying down cards on the table, taking actions on those cards, using your deck of cards as your as your energy, effectively, your your stamina, your life points, as you go through the deck slowly but surely, trying to be mindful of the decisions you make along the way, and learning the environments while you try to survive, gather tools, uh, interact with characters. It's going to build off what se off what Seventh Continent did, but it's going to do more. So you can have story points and interaction and degree of legacy and building up your encampment and things like that as you go through the experience. So there's more happening in the game. This is going to be a reprint campaign of the original. Seventh and Citadel, but also coming to you with a new threat as well. So there is a new threat in play if you want that. We have the Veteran Pledge over here for $50. That's going to give you uh, everyone who wants the uh, collectors, everyone who has the collector's box but wants to face the new threat while adding some fresh new twists to the game. It's going to be these other little extras you have over here. That's going to be €49 Euro for this pledge over here. We have the Novice Pledge for €87. Euro. That just gives you the base game over here. It's a reprint, November 2024, plain and simple, as fast as can be, although as fast as can be is relative, but November 2024 is not bad at all. 
We have the veteran and new gameplay all in for around $97, and then we have the rookie for $140, and we have the rookie and full gameplay all in for $260. And again, these are just giving you different levels of, do you already have the content, do you not? What are you looking for? Do you need all the content? Do you need just the new content? Do you need the old content? Do you need the new threat and all the old content? Do you need the new threat and just the new content? Lots of configurations for you to go ahead and get, but there's something here for everyone. And then of course, there's various stress goals being added, as, uh, being built out as you go through the game over here, giving you more content to the game as well. As far as should you back or should you not, and you, I know you might expect a longer uh, should you back it on this one, but I don't know if there's like, I mean, this game has been done, it's landed already, there's a lot to go over here. The gameplay itself is still getting solid reviews. There is a debate, it seems, as far as whether 7th Citadel or 7th Continent is the better game, uh, but overall, both are very well received and both ha generally have a lot of praise, although both are not for everyone. They both have a lot of filing cards and being mindful of that. You need to make sure this is a game for you, and the objectives aren't necessarily 100% clear all the time, so sometimes you're trying to infer what the objectives are as you navigate the landscape. You're trying to learn what you're trying to do as you go through it, which some people may not like that sense of vagary in the game. But as far as the actual game, as far as should you back or should you not, will hold its value? Well, the original 7 Citadel is holding its value just fine. If you look at most sold listings, both on the BGG Marketplace and on eBay, the original game is doing fine and holding its value from what people pay for versus what people are selling it for right now. So by that account, if you're interested in this game, this is still the cheapest option to get your hands on a lot of these different configurations. Not necessarily everything, and I'm sure you can definitely find a deal, but in general, these prices are good if you're someone who's interested in getting your hands on the game and are fine not getting it right now. But as far as whether if you back this right now, it will hold its value, I think that's a little more complicated. If you look at the original Seventh Continent, the first Kickstarter, the first one, definitely held its value just fine. The second one held its value at first. But then after that, the market was kind of flooded with too many copies, both being both people getting rid of their used copies over time, and then people who just, you know, there's too many copies in the market in general, that over time, the value in Seventh Continent definitely tanked a lot more. I think that's likely going to be true for Seventh Citadel. I think that if you back this game, you're likely looking at, even if even when you get it, whenever you get the full expansion, in the next copy or whatnot, I think it still will hold this value, at least initially. But I don't imagine that will hold true for long. I think that this is a game that, like Seventh Continent before it, eventually once that market is satiated with so many copies in circulation and a degree of fatigue and burnout of people who backed this game and three years later just didn't care anymore, I think over time the market will drop. I think it is a bit of a guessing game as far as whether the market will hold strong long enough for the next, ca for the next campaign. If you back this now, will your copy be worth it or will you better off not backing it or just waiting on the second market? Honestly, if you're on the fence and you're not, and you're not, you don't have a problem with getting a used copy, I think getting a used copy is probably the safest way to go. Just be patient, give it a few months, and you'll probably end up getting a copy anyway at a reasonable price point if you're not in a rush. That's going to be 7 Citadel over here. We also have Yokai Septet Pocket Edition. $16,000 raised, 987 backers, 11 days to go. Yokai Septet is coming to you from Ninja Star Games, and this is the Pocket Edition. They previously had the second edition, and now they're coming out with a smaller box version of the game. Yokai Septet, in general, is a trick taking game. A trick taking game where you're either, I believe, you're trying to get the sevens, I have to remember how it works. You're trying to either get something or you're trying to get a certain number of rank seven cards before you win seven times. That's what you're trying to do. So you're trying to get the sevens, but if you win too many times and you don't get the sevens, you lose the game. So winning is good, but only if you get the things that you're trying to get, which is, puts an interesting twist in it. In general, trick taking games always have the little twist as to what makes this puzzle interesting. And the idea that you want to win depending on what's in the hand is an interesting one as far as this one goes. In general, it got pretty solid reviews to begin with, but then it got a boost from Shut Up and Sit Down. And that boost is very important because they did a whole video over here of their um, 10 of the best new small box games, and that definitely made the market in this one go crazy in the sense that if you're trying to get your hands on Yokai Septet, uh, the original Kickstarter for the second edition, you have to pay like twice that on the second hand market to get your hands on a copy, which means this game did just fine in holding its value. And that has a decent chance of holding true for this campaign as well, but it's not for sure. Like, in general, Sharp and Sit Down definitely have an effect on the market, but that effect doesn't always last forever. It often depends on, frankly, how much their taste in the game uh, aligns with the general market. This is something you see in general with reviewers. Sometimes a reviewer loves a game that everyone loves, and sometimes reviewers love, love a game that not everyone loves. I have that on my end as well. I have, like, Aquatica, which I love, and a lot of people are okay with. And then I have, I don't know, what's a game that I love that everyone loves? Cthulhu Love May Die, and most people kind of love that game. So you'll always have that kind of situation going on. As far as Yokai Septet in general, though, if you want to get your hands on the game, this is the cheapest way to get your hands on the game, at least for right now. Granted, it's the Pocket Edition, not the Second Edition, so you want to make sure you're okay with that. But it's $13 for that, or $25 for two Pocket Edition copies. And again, in general, this is just the easiest way to get your hands on this trick taking game if you want it, uh, even with the shipping. Now, the problem is because of the shipping, once you factor in that, again, it's not a lot, but even coming in at, you know, $5 for shipping on top of that $12 or whatnot, you're looking at roughly $20 for a small pocket game, and will that hold this value down the road? I'd say it's cheap enough, just don't count on it. Uh, these smaller box games, it could, it just kind of depends on how long the shut and down effect lasts, which is variable, frankly. So not entirely sure. I put this in the maybe category, and also it's cheap enough that honestly, if you want it, get it, and if you don't want it, you probably don't need it at all. Moving on over here, 
we have, you know it, a new party game. 1,200 backers, 10 days to go, $60,000 raised, you know it, a new party game is coming to you from John Gracie from the No Rules Bar team. He put together a party game, or he and his wife and partner, or Matthew Hancock and his wife Viv Egan, made a brand new party game full of trivia, betting, and bluffing, and a degree of kind of hidden role as far as you're trying to both know the answers, but also guess who else is going to know the answer, with the ability to double down and bet on whether that person, whether you're right about that person, when you go ahead and put your guesses or whatnot. So you're trying to figure out, you're like, oh, well, like this is the question asked, and they look super confident, or are they bluffing me, are they not? Are people playing each other on the table? So it's a degree of a little bit of bluffing, a little bit of, not really hidden role, but hidden information, and then a little bit of trivia altogether, which is not the newest concept. I mean, the concept of, well, this concept maybe, but the general idea of mixing other people's knowledge into your trivia puzzle has been done before. Even things like Wits and Wagers, or Terra, or any of those games, all have a degree of trying to be mindful of your own knowledge of a thing, but also reading into and benefiting from others' knowledge too. This is just different in the way that it's doing so with a degree of bluffery or hiddenness and the way it's trying to do that, but either way, that's going to be the basic idea of you know it. Now the pleasures for the game are going to come in at around $36 for the game, and then you can pay $49 to get a color copy box of the game. And in general, I just think this is less likely to hold its value, especially once you factor in shipping on this. That's just a lot of money for a trivia game, and you know, you'll get USA another £10 or £9 for shipping on top of that. You're looking at $40, basically $45 for a trivia game, and usually it doesn't hold well over time. Like, you have to be a really good trivia game and or hard to get to be able to hold up to that, because when you're comparing that to games like, you know, uh, Codenames or So Clover or things like that, that also give you this degree of puzzly or, I I guess those are different games, but you get the idea. That kind of game, they're usually a little cheaper over here. I think this is largely being, being funded to an extent through no rules bar popularity, and hopefully there's a good game at the end of it, but I'm less skeptical, I'm more skeptical that this is one that will hold this value. Moving on over here, we have Mythic Battles is Fet. 3,300 backers, $697,000 raised, 10 days to go, and again, this is another one that's underperforming compared to the original. Like, if you look, well, forget the original, look at Mythic Battles Ragnarok, that did, what, $2 million, I think? And this is not going to hit $2 million. It might cross the million dollar mark, but it's going to be close on this one. But Mythic Battles is, fed, is going to be continuing, oh, also, I should say, speaking of Mythic Battles crack, uh, 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 Ragnarok, they have the Kraken expansion as well. So there's a reprint of the Kraken that will actually, by that account, is actually doing fairly poorly, if you argue that way, because this is for Mythic Battles is fed, it's for Mythic Battles Ragnarok, and it's for Mythic Battles, Ragnarok, the Kraken expansion. So there's new content for Kraken for, I keep saying that wrong. There's new content for Ragnarok owners. There's Ragnarok for people who missed out on it the first time. And then there's Isvet for people who, well, nobody can get Isvet until now. So Isvet is the first time to get your hands on this. So there's a lot of different types of content you can get here. And of course, there's the original Mythic Battles Pantheon as well. But I don't believe you can get this in this campaign. Mythic Battles is going to be a skirmish system. It's going to be a skirmish system where you take control of heroes or gods or deities or whatnot. And you're trying to get these divine stones. Or just kill the opponent's person, the opponent's deity instead. And so you're trying to be balancing those two things because both those are viable ways to win. The question is, which lever are you able to put a little bit more pressure on before your opponent accomplishes their goals. That's the general idea of the gameplay. There's a lot of nuance to it as far as how you run your cards, you know, how you activate your units, be mindful of how many times you spend activation cards and when you can actually get a unit activated or not, using Art of War cards to be able to power up and take additional actions or to do additional benefits or abilities. There's a lot of skirmish abilities going on, there's a lot of player abilities or unit abilities, there's a lot of nuances to the individual maps you go on, and this game has three ways to play. There's going to be the base game, the, the skirmish mode, there's going to be the, uh, the scenario mode, which gives you a slight nuance versions or rules to, the, to the how to play, and there's going to be an adventure mode as well that gives you a little kind of a mini campaign to go through. So a lot of ways to engage with Mythic Battles uh, is fed over here. We have the 100, 120 euro, you're going to have the basic version of Mythic Battles Isfet, plus all stretch goals in the game. For 259 euro, you get the Mythic Battles Isfet all in over here, which gives you all this stuff, all these boxes. I'm not heavily going to be going through every single, uh, you know, miniature and thing on these over here, but you can get a general idea. There's going to be a lot of content for this game. For 120 euro, you have the Norse God Pledge for Mythic Battles Ragnarok, in case you missed out on that. And then we have for the all in, for 299 euro, for the Norse all in pledge, which gives you all the content, but also going to give you the new content for the Kraken expansion over here. So the Asgard expansion, the Kraken expansion, the Destroyer's Box, the Ragnar Saga, the Dice Tray, a whole lot of content for the game. And then we have the new content all in, which is going to be 325 euro to get your hands on everything from Mythic Battles Isfet, plus of course the uh, Kraken expansion as well. And then you're going to have, lastly, you're going to have the, uh, where are we over here? The uh, Mythic Battles Isfet content over here for, I'm just, like, zooming in, I'm realizing I'm a little too close to the camera over here. Let me back up, I'm still getting used to like this whole set up over here. Anyways, over here, that's going to be all the things you can get for these pledges over here. So a lot of ways to spend money on this game. I'm realizing I'm gonna let me just zoom out a drop on this camera. Sorry, I'm just I'm I'm realizing how uncomfortably close I am to the camera. Anyways, uh, that's when we have we have new content all in, and that's kind of everything. I'm honestly a little surprised I didn't have a all in all in. 
Do they have? No, they didn't have an all-in all-in, which is a little surprising. They don't have that one. That's basically as far as the uh, game ca game contents over here. Uh, you can check out more content on the channel. You can check out a preview as well as a gameplay if you want to check out that. Small rules errors in the gameplay. Nothing that overly changes the, well, I mean, it definitely would have an impact on the gameplay. But as far as getting a feel for it, you can get a feel for that if you want to check that out. But past that, this is Mythic Battles, which means either it's a system you already know and love, or it's not a system you know and love, in which case you can check out a ton of content on any of the three iterations, from Mythic Battles Pantheon to Ragnarok to Isfet. They're all going to have different things or nuances or abilities or stuff that changes and iterates, but the core concept of it is going to be the same across those three arcs. As far as should you back or should you not, will hold this value. It's an interesting one for sure. If you look at Mythic Battles Ragnarok, which has just landed, the, that one is holding its value just fine so far in the secondary market. Again, eBay, BGG, it's holding its value overall. There are some that sold for less, but for the most part, people are getting their money back on that one, which means I'm kind of inclined to believe that Mythic Battles Isfet will fall into the same place. I just assume that it's, it's hard to say for sure, but I do assume that Mythic Battles Isfet will fall into the same place as far as, um, as far as, uh, I mean, there's fewer people backing this, but it's still a popular system overall. It's still a system that's generally done well, and at least for sure, initially, when the game comes out, usually these games have done a great job holding their value. They have fantastic miniature production. They're a fantastic, well-weighted game, well-loved game system. So overall, I think this is still one that's going to hold its value, even though it's not performing as well as the last Kickstarter. Moving on over here, we have Agamonia, Reprint, and New Heroes. 2,000 backers over here, $182,000 raised, 11 days to go. Agamonia Reprint plus New Heroes over here is going to be, well, Agamonia. Agamonia is going to be a campaign game that combines a degree of combat, a degree of story, a degree of exploration. Uh, you're going to have these story cards. You're going to be moving around and interacting and seeing things happen and just going through a degree of testing and combat and all this stuff in this, well, campaign game across roughly 30-ish missions or so as you go through the game. You can check out a full series of videos of the gameplay currently on the channel. I hope to have a review out before the campaign ends, but I cannot make any guarantees. I have... Too much travel coming up in the next 11 days, so we'll see what happens over there. But this basically is going to be an opportunity to get the game again, uh, or to get the game to get the reprint of the game, as well as the new content, which includes new heroes. Speaking of which, the just the new stuff over here is going to include two new heroes, and it specifies it does not include miniatures. They do have this in the FAQ, but it's worth noting it for those who don't look at the FAQ. If you're like, well, then how do I get the miniatures for the new heroes? They're already in the box. They already made the miniatures for these heroes, knowing they were going to develop the content for them, and they just wanted to make sure the miniatures are there and available. So if you don't get these, you just have two extra miniatures uh, with no content for the miniatures. If you do get this, well, you already have the miniatures. Well, I mean, if you get the new content and you don't have Agamonia, that's a whole different problem to deal with, which we will not get into right now. But if you do have Agamonia or plan on getting Agamonia and you're also getting this new stuff, you will have the miniatures in Agamonia already. Just clarifying that up in case you uh, don't read the FAQ and you're confused and wondering. Save you uh, the time typing out a question and all that stuff. As far as Agamonia goes, we have 35 euro for the new stuff over here. We have 109 euro for the core box. We have 229 euro for the all in. Because keep in mind, the core box does not have the uh, enemy miniatures over here. That red box is going to be enemy miniatures. Now, enemy standees do just fine if you want to save money, if you want to experience this game. I definitely recommend try. Well, we'll get to the recommendation soon in a second. Well, actually, let's do it now. Uh, if you want to experience Agamonia, I highly recommend Agamonia. I think it's an excellent game. I think in general, it's been getting a lot of a lot of praise, a lot of solid reviews, and it feels different than some of the games out there. A lot of these dungeon crawlers now, to a certain extent, sometimes they end up feeling a little bit like each other. In the case of Agamonia, I think it feels very, very distinct, very much like its own beast, and I, I'm a huge fan of the game, very big fan of the game. Uh, so if you want to try the game out, 109 euro over, here, over there, plus of course shipping, is going to be the cheapest way to try it, because this game costs you $200 in retail to get your hands on just the core box, but get the miniatures. And so if you want to try it out, you can use some standees for the enemies, it's not a big deal, it'll save the storage and maintenance and all that stuff, and you can try out the system. Or you can go ahead and get the end miniatures as well, and various upgraded chips, and new characters, and all those things. And new characters, I mean, I don't think you'll need those unless you're going through the game a lot, you'll have characters to go through. So, like, I don't think you need all the new stuff. I think the miniatures, is, you'll know your own personal taste, whether that's something you care about or not. And the core box, yeah. So there's a lot of things to go through over there. As far as should you back it, will it hold its value and all that? Uh, currently, yes, because currently Agamonia is really expensive to get your hands in it. If you're going to get retail, it's currently a $200 game, and this price point over here is basically giving you all the content that you can get at a roughly equivalent price to retail. It's going to cost a little more if you're going all in, but you can get a lot of the content over here for a roughly equivalent price of getting just the base game at retail alone. And so overall, this is one that likely will hold its value combined with the fact that the game is well received, has a lot of solid ratings, and in general, the, the original game has been doing fine in the second market so far. I imagine that will hold true as well, this is giving people an opportunity to get your hands on the game system who missed it the first time around. It's one of those games that like got a lot of buzz, but like doesn't have doesn't have that 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 la like some games hit and they just like hit a million dollars, three million dollars, four million dollars. Agamonia didn't do that. It didn't do it the first time around, it's not doing it the second time around. But it is a well-rated, well-liked system from those who managed to get their hands on it at all. 
Moving on over here, we have Secret Villages of Santa's Workshop plus related story puzzles. 2,390 backers, $152,000 raised, 12 days to go. This is coming to you from Elf Creek Games, and granted, Elf Creek Games has definitely burnt a little bit of uh, goodwill in general. It's just their, their campaigns have, had seen some, have seen some issues in the past. They've taken longer to deliver. They've been lack of communication. I tend to be very sympathetic to the companies, but I also tend to be sympathetic to the backers who have gone through that, and there are unfortunately probably a lot of people who have already moved on and just aren't giving this a shot because... Well, they might be done with Elf Creek, and I, I get that. That said, there's a lot of stuff here if you are interested, from an expansion to Merchant of the Dark Road, as well as Santa's Workshop Deluxe, and also two Elf Creek credit, credits. They have been so far delivering everything, just taking longer than you would ideally like. Uh, so they at least have been following through. And there's Santa's Workshop, Santa's Workshop Deluxe, Merchant of the Dark Road expansion, and of course some story puzzles as well to go through. So this is going to be the options to get your hands in over here. Uh, the expansion over here to uh, Merchant of the Dark Road, is going to be the, I can't remember what it's called anymore, the uh, Secret Villages expansion, which is going to add a new board section to the board, if I can find it down here. There's going to be a new board section, this section down here, which is going to give you new cards over here. They're going to give you these hero cards, and you're going to have, additionally, you're going to have this village section. Let's see if you can find the Secret Villages. We're going to be gaining leads over here. You're going to be gaining leads from the marketplace, visiting the villages, and activating the various leads in these new areas over here. So going to be new tokens that go on the marketplace board. Meanwhile, you also have the Green Grey Rumors over here, which are going to give you opportunities to go ahead and uh, gather rumors, to gain rumors, activating districts of the night dice to gain rumors there, and then spread those rumors at the Ring, Ring Ray Inn to get various information about the Baroness. So there's two interlinking modules kind of going together. I don't know if they officially go together, but I think they go together in the gameplay as far as uh, gathering those new heroes, the new hero boards, and those new leads for the various villages. That's going to be the expansion ads. There's also the Santa's Workshop Deluxe. Santa's Workshop is a, um, I might cough soon. Santa's Workshop is a, um, resource no, what's the word for it? Resource management? Resource management game of gathering various things and building various prizes for the various little children. And it's going to give you a deluxe version of that game. So if you want to go ahead and check this out, this is going to give you screen printed wooden elves, screen printed wooden Santa, resin material tokens, plastic assembly tokens, wooden ornament tokens with foil detailing, and a Christmas tree with heat transfer graphics, and wooden score markers with heat transfer graphics. So all these upgraded tokens for the uh, Santa's Workshop Deluxe. And then there's puzzles too. There's going to be puzzles as well as far as these go. So a puzzle for Merchant of the Dark Road and Santa's Workshop is going to be added as well. As far as should you back or should you not, will it hold this value? I have a harder time believing this one will overall. Puzzles in general are a different conversation. I'm not going to get into this at all. But the Secret Villages expansion, the deluxe version over here, $59, that might hold this value because, again, it's, you know, want pe there are going to be people who want to get their hands on this who miss out on the campaign. For the amount of copies that there are of Merchant of the Dark Road in the Wild versus the amount of copies of this game that are currently being backed, that one might hold this value just because there is there's going to be likely some degree of demand for it, although the demand that's going to be tricky because very often people are going to watch just the expansion, and the people getting rid of it is going to be getting rid of the base game and the expansion, so it's a little tricky on that one. Sometimes it works out deluxe. I do think that's a lighter game. I am skeptical that one will hold its value, but if you do want a deluxe fire copy or just get a deluxe version of it, this is, this is definitely an opportunity to get your hands on it. So the Secret Villages could go either way. Santa's Workshop and the puzzles, I think, a little less so. From there, we have Pillars of Her Her Heracles, Awaken the Legends. Pillars of Her Heracles is going to be coming to you from the same people who did um, uh, the something of a cow, Pillars of Ah, uh, uh, oh my gosh. You Yucatan? No, not Yucatan. What is it called again? Oh my gosh, that's going to bother me. How something of Yucatan. Right? It's a how rulers of Yucatan. That's what it was. That's what it was. That's what the, that's the, so they uh, appear in games. But anyway, uh, Pillars of Heracles over here is going to give you a drafting area control game, which you're going to be going ahead and, uh, well, trying to uh, gather control of areas. I apologize. I don't have, I don't have a, a good, as good of a grasp on how this one actually plays compared to the rest over here. But overall, the game is going to be $49 for the Pillars of Heracles cl classic edition of the game. It's going to be $89 for the epic edition, which gives you miniatures as well. It's going to be 105 for the heroic edition, which also gives you the fifth player. So those are going to be the three main pledges you're looking at over here. We have the mythic edition as well, which we're not going to get into, but that's going to be the painted miniatures. I, I guess that means I just got into it. As far as the game itself, uh, this is going to be coming to you from the people who did a How It Was Yucatan, which was received well enough, but not necessarily amazing, so I'm unsure where to go with that one. Uh, as far as the price point on this one, I think the price point just puts it in a harder place, unfortunately. I think looking at the game as far as, you know, $89 for the game with the miniatures, or $59, $49, and comparing it to How a How did in the second-hand market, I think this is one that's less likely to hold this value. Uh, currently, we have, what is it, we have, what is the math people we have over here? 534 backers currently on the campaign, which is less than, you know, again, the math popularity you see on crowd funding usually does translate into second-hand market. So overall, this one, I think the game looks cool. There is a lot of uh, coverage in the game if you want to check that out. So if you do want this game on its own, then that makes sense. But if you're wondering if it will hold this value or not, I'm skeptical it will, just primarily based on how the last campaign did. Moving on, we have Bunny Bunny Boom from Grim. 
we have two of them ruse. Uh, ruse games. Uh, Bunny Bunny Boom is a game where you're trying to go ahead and get as many bunnies as possible. Well, trying to get as few bunnies as possible. You're trying to make sure your opponents get as many bunnies as possible. There's 3 and 20 backers, 17 days left in the campaign, $29,000 Canadian raised so far, and this is going to be giving you a game of all well, placing down cards as you try to make sure that bunnies move all around the board. You're going to be placing down a card, activating the effect on that card, and then moving the person from wherever the person is, moving your person to the card, and then activating the effects of the movement along the way. And that's going to generally involve lots of bunnies being spread across the board and hopefully getting in the uh, way of other players in the game. And then the game who has the most bunnies is basically going to be, uh, well, you have a few ways to score points, but most bunnies is going to be a big chunk of your points in the game and losing points from that. That's going to be the core concept of the game. The pledge levels over here, we have the all-in pledge level, which is going to give you the base game and the playmat for $70 Canadian. I think it's around 55 US or maybe 53 US, somewhere in that range. We have 52.50 Canadian for the base pledge, it's going to be around 35 US over there. And this is, of course, the plus shipping. And then past that, there's additional pledges that give you multiple pledges as well. There's also opportunities to get your hands on Ruse, the base game over here, or, well, any of the Ruse content from their previous campaign as well if you want to try to get your hands on any of that. And then over here, that's basically what we got over there as far as that goes. And then we have down here for shipping. We have shipping is going to run you around $15 US for the uh, base copy of the game. Although they do have stretch goals to lower some of that shipping over here, so we'll see how that goes. But if they hit certain stretch, certain, uh, stretch goals, they'll lower the shipping cost a bit. But as far as it goes, as far as should you back, should you not, will hold this value. I'm skeptical it will. Uh, just once you factor in the price point plus the shipping, even with the $2 shipping desk account, unless they give out a whole lot more of those, this does fall in the category of a game that does, it's going to be have a harder time holding this value on the second hand market. I will say if you want to guarantee a copy of the game, with only 320 backers currently, the best way to guarantee a copy is backing on the crowdfunding campaign, but it's less likely to be one that holds this value. Moving on, how many do we have left today? We have one, two, three, four campaigns left to go, although this next one is likely the big one. Coming in at $1.8 million, 9,611 backers, uh, 17 days left to go, Grim Coven is going to be coming to from Awakened Realms, and it's going to give you a boss battle game for one to four players, as players try to uh, take on a dark Victorian universe where they try to take down this boss, all the various minions and the elites in their way, uh, before they die. Frankly, before they die, that's what you're trying to do. You can check out a ton of content on this game. You can check out content on my channel, you can check out a review on my channel, you can check out Shelf Side Review if you want a fully in-depth review that's going to be fairly critical of the game, Shelf Side's got you covered there. There's a lot of content out there from a variety of creators. I do like, especially when the game is this popular, I do like pointing to a more critical review, just so you have that information. And if you're looking for someone to throw some water on your dreams and make you question whether you should pay for this, then by all means, check out the Shelf Side review to see. And again, even there, there's positive in it, but uh, check that out to, to see if it's a game that you think is for you or not. Uh, past that, a ton of people covered it. Uh, you know, uh, Ant Lab Games covered it, uh, before One Stop Co-op Shop, myself, and a whole lot of Brian Gale. Yeah, Brian Gear, Game Grade, a lot of content creators have covered this game. You can check all of that out. As far as the game itself, the game is basically going to be, well, a boss battler. You're going to have your heroes in the game. You're going to be wandering around this board, taking on a scenario, taking on the individual bosses or enemies you're fighting along the way. It's mix and match. You can have scenario, hunters, bosses, elites, all these different things, plus the variety of events and the variety of map effects, the uh, environment effects that will come into play as you go through the game. So a ton of stuff to keep the game variable as you go through it. And then from there, you're going to be developing your hunter as you go, as you do different things in the game, as you go to various spots, as you kill different enemies. You'll be generating a, a resource that you can go ahead and trade in to to go ahead and upgrade your character, getting either more dice, which gives you more actions, or new abilities, which gives you more ways to spend your dice and more ways to combine different things together. So a lot of stuff as far as the character upgrading goes. Uh, as far as the, the game itself, uh, looking at the, the as far as the game itself, there's gonna be two main game, two main versions of the game. There's gonna be the standard version of the game, which is gonna be a standee version, and then the special edition, which gives you the miniatures, which means you could experience this game for as low as fifty nine dollars if you don't mind getting standees for well everyone, for the hunters, for the minute, for the enemies, for all the things. This is gonna be the budget version of getting getting hands in the game, giving you a big box experience at a lower price point, but without the miniatures. Or for $109, you can get the full uh, Groom Coven, Groom Coven everything, as well as all the exclusive content in the campaign, and for the full deluxe version of that. That's going to be what you have over there. And there's all these variety of hunters, they all have different ways they transform, they all have different decks and abilities, so lots of variety as far as how these characters build out. Then from there, there's also going to be more content as well. We have the special edition for the, there, and Sundrop, Sundrop is going to be an additional cost. You can go ahead and do that when you go ahead and customize your options. If you do want your miniature, Sundrop's going to cost you more as well. And then for add-ons, we have the personal stories over here for backstories for the hunters. We have the Renegade Hunter mini expansion over here, which I believe was a follower gift if you follow the campaign. We have the acrylic add on, the train add on, the play mat, the Grim Coven artwork, and the Grim Coven sleeves. That's going to be different options over here. A train add on is what it sounds like. It's going to be giving you terrain effects for the various uh, spots on the board. If you want even more cinematicness, if you want miniatures for everything, that'll give you that. The acrylic add on is going to give you all the tokens, including some of the, the hunters. Like one of the hunters has a sword that flips as you go. Very cool concept over there. I like the different hunters and the different abilities. This obviously has inspiration from Bloodborne in it. We have a uh, 
play mats over here. So all these various things over here, uh, those are all going to be different options you can go and get your hands on. And those are going to be in the Grim Coven Hunter's Pledge for $199. So if you want this over here, that's going to be a $15 discount if you get all of that combined. So if you do want all that stuff, just factor in this $15 discount there. And then we have the Core Pledge for $59 and the Special List for $109. And then shipping is going to run you over here. You can check out the various options, but the uh, Hunter's Pledge for the USA is going to be $38 on top of that, which is a chunk, but off of the $214, not the craze as far as the overall amount, although the sun drop as well, so this can get to $300. <coughs> Sorry, managed to hold up this long. <coughs> you can get to $300 without... Uh, without trying too hard on this campaign. Well, actually, $300 might be pushing it. You can get to around the $300 range on this campaign. Anyways, as far as should you back or should you not, will it hold this value? The short answer is yes, it will hold this value. Awaken Realms games still do hold the value in the second hand market, and I do believe this game is going to be well enough received. There is definitely criticism out, of the, out, out. There's definitely criticism on the game already. You can see it in my review, you can see it in uh, Game Brigade, and uh, you know, Shelf Side for sure, there's more folks there. There's definitely areas of this game that need to be streamlined or adjusted. For me personally, the thing I was focusing the most on is I want the Hunter's abilities to be more interesting and more ways you can interweave them together, because they do kind of get stale a little bit as you go through repeated plays of those game of those characters so for the most part I want to see more coolness going on, but there are a variety of other complaints out there. I talked about the fact that the game is difficult. You need to be mindful of that. The game can definitely be difficult. It'll, it's very hard to win, especially the first time. Although once you get the tempo down, you certainly can win it right now. But there are certainly complaints out there. But Wake Realms generally does work on their games. They, for, they've they gotten to a space now as a, as a publisher where they always have people who are chasing down every little detail and criticizing lots of details of the campaigns and like, this is the problem, this, this is that. But at the end of the day, their games usually do deliver. Their games usually are fairly well rated and do hold the value in the second market. And I anticipate that being true for Grim Coven as well. I mean, this campaign is going to likely cross the 4 million mark, which means it is continuing to, like, Awakening Realms campaigns do have a range. Like, you know, you're sure you have Nemesis Retaliation at the 12 million dynasty side of things. But if you even, even look at their games, like, the Great Wall does, like, a million dollars. Like, their games have a range of how popular they are. And Grim Coven does seem to be falling into that, like, Stalker Plus or whatnot. So it's going to be a popular game. It should do fine in the second market. Any of these pledge levels are likely going to be doing fines, whatever you get, whether you get the retail, whether you get the, not the retail, the basic version of the game, the deluxe version of the game, or the all-in, all those are likely going to hold the value just fine. Historically, they have so far. Moving on over here, we have Apothecary over here. Apothecary, the Culinary Alchemist. $411,000 raised, 4,259 backers, 18 days to go. Apothecary is going to come to you from Luke, Luke's Lupo Games, and it's their first project, so kudos to them already, because you made something that's doing incredibly well. It has a lot of visual appeal, and when it comes to crowdfunding, people do back with their eyes. That is how crowdfunding works, uh, for better or for worse, and probably for worse, it's probably for worse. But your game does look adorable. The game looks charming. It does look on the lighter side, but it does look like a charming game. We're going to be collecting various herbs. You're going to be using your various friends or whatnot to convert those, your various abilities and whatnot to convert those, uh, you know, all these, these goods you're collecting into these various potions. So you can go ahead and, well, heal your friend's ailments along the way. So basically, you gather the three main phases. Let's gather and then, like, you know, uh, manipulate or whatnot with a degree of bag building and push your luck elements going on. And then just ultimately trying to heal your friends before they die and come back from the dead and haunt you. That's not me being flippant. That's actually a mechanic in the game. As far as the game over here... We have uh, $63 for the Apothecary Precious Deluxe over here, and that's basically the play main pleasure they have. They also have the Master Alchemist, which is a small expansion, but there's not a retail edition on this one. They're just giving you a full pre stretched Deluxe. That's what it is. This is the, the version of the game you're getting, all those various upgrades and goodies, and the best version and all that stuff. Again, we've seen this concept before. In general, there's either stretch goals, daily unlocks, or like here's your Deluxe version out the gate and enjoy it. Uh, the game does look very cool. The game has like these little mini expansions going on in the game. Uh, there's the actual expansion for the Master Alchemist, uh, the overall components and Contents, everything. Look at these tokens. Tokens look great. Everything looks great in the game. It has a lot of visual appeal. There's a reason it's doing $400,000. It's going to do. It's cute. It's got visual appeal. Uh, the game overall looks like a fun experience. Uh, the, the main thing, my main question is just how of uh, how heavy of an experience is it? Like, it's so cute, it hurts. That's great. But like, is it a game that's going to give me a engaging strategic experience, or is it more focused on uh, being a lighter experience? And nothing wrong with either. You just have to know a game's place in your collection and when you're going to pull it out and play it. But either way, that's as far as this game goes, and then the tricky part is going to be shipping. Because you're coming, you're coming in looking at this as a $63 game, but the shipping part is where it kills it, because it's $25 to $29 for the game. And that, unfortunately, is where I was going from, hey, this probably is going to hold this value, it means $63 seems very reasonable for a game that looks this good and has uh, all the components luxified already, that seems like a very reasonable price point. 
once you factor in the $30 for shipping, that pushes it to the next level. And so ultimately, I do think this is one that is less likely to hold this value. I don't know how heavy the game is actually going to be and how well it's received will be a factor for sure. But instinctively, just looking at what we're seeing over here, the $30 shipping, usually that kind of thing can be a deal breaker when you're looking at somebody down the road who's saying, hey, like, why not paying $100 for your $63 game? Even just perception alone, it is less likely to be one that holds this value because of that high shipping cost relative to the actual full cost of the game. So overall, this one looks very cool. It might be a good, if you want to get your hands on the game, by all means, again, it's a great way to do it. But uh, if it's not a game that works for you, it likely will not hold this value. Moving on, we have Clash D-Day Special Edition over here from Elwyn Clap. Clash D-Day Special Edition is going to be uh, building off the same system from Clash... Oh, Clash something else. There was uh, another Clash game. What is it called? Clash uh, Clash of the Ardennes. Clash of the Ardennes. Uh, that's the, it's building off that system. We have 318 backers, 26,000 euro raised so far. Uh, 23 days left to go. This is going to be building off of the Clash of the Ardennes game, but when Clash D-Day instead. Uh, it is a lighter weight war game. So it is a war World War II theme game and whatnot, but it is a lighter weight game as far as that goes. It's not like a heavy, heavy game system. Uh, you're going to be placing tokens down onto these beaches over here trying to, uh, you know, well, win over your opponent over there. Uh, the pledge levels are going to have three main pledges. You're going to have the D-Day Special Edition for 59 euros. You're going to have the Clash of the Ardennes plus D-Day Special Edition for 99 euro. And then from there, you're just getting a group pledge over here. As far as you're back, or you're not, we'll hold this value. Looking at the original Clash of the Ardennes, I don't believe it will. The original Clash of the Ardennes does not go for that much in the second-hand market, and in fact, you'd be paying more for it to get your hands in it here than it's available in the second-hand market, and the factor in the Clash of the Special Edition as well, I just think this is less likely to be, you know, one that is sought after enough. It's a well-weighted enough system. Like, it is a liked game. Like, overall, if you're looking for a game system that, you know, a lighter, more 44-style war game, like in that vein, I think this might be, your, be, be for you. But if you are someone who dabbles in the second market, this is one that just doesn't do as well in the second market, or at least the Clash of the Dens hasn't uh, so far. Moving on, and lastly, we have Operation Barclay. Another World War II themed game. Or is this World War II themed game? I think so. Maybe. Uh, but we have, yeah, 1942-1943. I feel it's World War II. I should probably know my dates better. Either way, Operation Barclay from Salt and Pepper Games, 15,000 euro raised, 470 backers, 24 days left to go, and this campaign, this campaign even has, sorry, the cough is tickling my throat, it's not, it's not a good week. I mean, it's a great week, but it's not a good fulfilling. Uh, this also has a secret game as well coming on this campaign, which we'll get to. So there is a secret game that you may have missed if you were just scanning various crowdfunding uh, titles and all that. But Operation Barclay, a two-player game of low, medium, and complexity, where you're trying to basically, what's a very fascinating little puzzle here, you're going to be putting tokens down at different zones on the board, and then let me see if I can find this part over here. You're trying to get those tokens out onto the main board, so kind of think a little bit like a Watergate as far as gaining control of the main board, the different types of tokens, uh, the evidence tokens, but in this case, there are these various tokens that go down there. You're placing tokens down, into, you're placing cards one at a time onto the tableau and then drawing new cards into your hand. Uh, then you're going to go ahead and reveal those cards. You're going to be, um, what are you doing over here? The player with the best hand wins the two evidence tokens. The player who successfully bet on the best hands wins the three evidence tokens in the beta box. And the player with the most reconnaissance cards gets the third, gets the last token. So there's six tokens up for grab. But the question is, are you betting on winning yourself or are you betting on the other person? And how are you trying to manage your hand? Because there's six tokens up for grab and you can either get three, two, four, three, any different combination. We get one of them, a whole bunch of different ways to get these tokens and trying to be mindful of that puzzle is fascinating because if you think your opponent bet on you, you might actually intentionally lose the cat and lose it in order to be able to go ahead and get the tokens in the middle. So very interesting situation over here as far as the as far as the puzzle goes of trying to get as many tokens as possible to be able to gain control of the actual overall map. But then that's not all. We also have down here another secret game. If I can go ahead and find it, we have a secret game down here. We have Thingstead. Thingstead by Scott Alms is a secret game that is available in this campaign and this campaign only, or I guess it might be available in you know retail down the road. But uh, from the claim design of Scott Alms, a Thingstead is a two-player game where you're trying to become the new chieftain of your clan through playing all these cards over here. So a whole little secret game kind of just hidden in the bottom of this campaign, and we can go ahead and go to the pledge levels because you can go ahead and I think it's just an add-on. It's not even a, not even a pledge level. It's really hidden. We have Operation Barclay for 21 euro, and then the add-on section we have Thingstead for 22 euro, as well as Unreliable Wizard or Resist if you want those, and then shipping is going to be the part that makes it hard as we again, because shipping in the USA is going to run you 12 euro on top of that. And in general, uh, Salt and Peppers games do tend to be available in retail down the road, which as much as I support their games, I think their games are very solid. They've come out as a great publisher doing a lot of small box, tactical, very strong games that have just look great, play great, short play times, they make very accessible games. But their retail presence is usually so strong that for most people, getting it at retail will make the most sense. Uh, as opposed to getting crowdfunding, we're usually paying a little more to support the creator, get a little early, and in the case of some that may or may not show up, it's just in case, hedging your bets. Hedging your bets is the reason to get this over here. Or, of course, if you're in a place where you can't get a typical online retail, and this might be your best price after all. 
And that's basically what we have over here. So as far as holding its value in general, I think it doesn't hold its value, but I do support getting the games if you have the opportunity to do so. And that's basically everything, which means it's time for Picks of the Week. Picks of the Week, I'm going to have two as usual. We're going to have the game that I think is most likely to hold its value, and then the game that's my personal interest pick of the week. And for the one that's most likely to hold its value, I am going to go with Grim Coven. And there are a bunch to choose from. We have Grim Coven, we have uh, arguably Agamonia, we have Mythic Battles, but I think Grim Coven is likely going to have the largest gap in terms of holding its value overall, compared to just how Wicked Realms titles usually do. And for my personal interest pick of the week, I gotta go with Agamonia. I love this game. I think Agamonia is a great game, very satisfying experience. Uh, campaign games are games that I generally get a little bit I find I throw a lot of time into them and I get burnt down on those systems and Agamonia is still fresh enough because a lot of it's about the discovery and not just about the mechanics itself. It's actually a little lighter than the mechanics which could be a critique against it, but overall Agamonia is going to be my personal interest pick of the week this week. As far as campaigns coming up next week, we have not actually had that busy next week. We have uh, Trekking the World 2nd Edition with 745 followers currently coming, launching a Kickstarter. And we have Dark Blood uh, launching a game found from Meeple Pug with 7,000 inch people following this campaign. And I will know more about this by the time it launches. I uh, have the prototype and uh, only just got the rules just the other day, so I have not even had a chance to dive into this yet. But by the time you're watching this video, hopefully I'm already midway through the rules. And that's basically everything we have over here. In any case, and until next time, I'm Alex Rath from Board Game Co. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I apologize for the slight tickle in my throat and also any things that come along with the new set because uh, we're still learning here and still figuring it all out together. So uh, one day at a time. In any case, and until next time, I hope you have a good one. Do you know that Lance is a pretty uncommon name these days? But in the medieval times, people were called Lance a lot. <laughs>